Number three of the book of Matthew, going through verse by verse each week. We have a chapter, and we're going through the book of Matthew in the overall picture. Uh, before we jump into Matthew chapter number three, I want to do a quick review on a couple of things that we saw in Matthew chapter number one and Matthew chapter number one, uh, two, I'm sorry. So first off, in Matthew chapter number one, we saw the genealogy of Christ. That's how the book of Matthew begins. That's how the New Testament begins. And it makes perfect sense because all throughout the Old Testament, we're pointing towards the Christ. We're pointing towards uh, the cross. Then when we get to the New Testament, the very first thing that we see is the genealogy uh, that is leading through the Old Testament history up to the point of the birth of Christ. Now that genealogy is specific. There's genealogies that are given you know, in the book of Luke. And uh, there is also, you know, if you would consider a, an origin in the book of John, but it's really that he has no origin. It's that he has always existed because he is God. So there's a different theme in each book of the Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the theme of the book of Matthew is the fact that Jesus is the king of the Jews. So the genealogy that we see in Matthew is, number one, beginning with Abraham, who is the father of the Jews. It leads its way down to David and it highlights and emphasizes David who is known as the king. He is the greatest king that they ever had. And then it follows the royal line of all of the kings down to the king of kings who is Jesus Christ. The theme of the whole book of Matthew is the king of the Jews. It is very much geared towards a Jew. It's obviously profitable for everyone. But it's geared towards someone that is familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. It quotes more Old, Old Testament verses uh, than any of the other Gospels. And it shows Jesus in the light of being a Jew and being the Messiah, being, being the King. We see the birth of Jesus at the end of Matthew chapter number 1. Then in Matthew chapter number 2, we see the story of the wise men, which is also... And this, this story is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a story that's highlighting his kingship. It's these royal men that are bringing uh, treasures to him to bow down unto him. And what they say to Herod when they come looking for Jesus is, we're looking for the king of the Jews. Uh, that story, like I said, is only found in the book of Matthew. It follows through and you see how Herod tries to kill Jesus by killing all of the children that are two and under. He flees into Egypt and then he comes back and it ends with the fact that they settled into Nazareth in the area of Galilee, which would be of the Gentiles. We're going to see that in, in uh, Matthew chapter number 4. So here in Matthew chapter number 3, it switches gears a little bit. It says in verse number 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now this is the first introduction to John the Baptist, the character that we know so well of or as John the Baptist. This is what he's referred to as. One time he's called John Baptist, but we know him as John the Baptist. Now, just some basic things about John the Baptist. A lot of people don't know this, maybe that haven't read the, the whole Bible in its entirety, but John the Baptist was actually cousins with Jesus. He would be, we're not sure if he's first or second cousins, but he's, he is one time removed a cousin from Jesus. So he's a cousin of Jesus. Jesus, he is, uh, uh, his, his Mary and Elizabeth, so John the Baptist's mother was Elizabeth, and uh, we know as Zacharias was his father, uh, uh, Elizabeth, his mother, was actually a, a cousin with, G uh, with uh, I'm sorry, Mary, so Elizabeth and Mary were cousins, and obviously them being, uh, uh, you know, cousins as well, being one time removed. It tells you, when it introduces him, it says that he's preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, Wilderness here is referring to desert. It's probably not how we would use the word wilderness today. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you in a, here in a minute. But when it says the wilderness, what it's saying is that he's going out into the desert. So he's, John the Baptist went out into the desert to preach. And when it says Judea, as we saw from Matthew chapter number 2, that's Judah. So the area that we know as Judah, that's where he went. He went out into the desert of Judah and he began... To preach, I want you to look with me at verse number four just to get an idea, a, a feel of you know what type of person John the Baptist was. Look at verse number four; it gives us some more details. It says, "And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey." So when you, you read about John the Baptist, I mean, most people, when they would read this, they would be like, man, you know, you know, seriously, man, this is a man's man, obviously. This is a rough character. He's obviously not your typical, you know, uh, preacher of today. He's definitely not 
think if you're compare him to like the TV evangelist, you know, what in the world is Joel Osteen going to have in common with John the Baptist, right? Not nothing at all, obviously. This is a rough character. He's living out in the wilderness. We're not going to turn to this right now, but the Bible actually teaches that, you know, once he got to of age, he went out into the wilderness and he stayed out into the wilderness until the time of his calling. So he was out there preparing in the wilderness. This guy, you know, what we did, fellows, was not really truly roughing it on that trip. You know, he's living out in the wilderness and really living out here. That's, that is his home, right? So he's out in the wilderness. And not only that, he's wearing, when it says raiment, that means clothing. So he's wearing an outfit made of camel's hair. Now that's not, you know, luxurious. That's not, you know, lavish, even slightly, Right? You know, uh, there's a reason why you can't go out and buy an outfit made of, of camel's hair. You know, it's extremely thick, I'm sure. Brother Hall, I'm sure your wife wouldn't appreciate it if you purchased her an outfit made of camel's hair, right? It's obviously not something that people wear today. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very crude type of outfit is what it is. That's what it's referring to because he's a rough character. He's not, he's not worried about the things of this world. You know, he, his, obviously his kingdom is in heaven and that's what he's concerned about. That's the picture that's being painted. Then he has a leathern, that means leather, girdle. Now, girdle means belt. When you think of girth, like if you measure your girth, it's around your stomach, right? A girdle is a belt. So he has a leather girdle about his loins. He's just, everything about this guy just screams, you know, he's just a rough man. He's a rough character. A leathern girdle about his loins, and it says, and his meat. Now, meat means food. His meat was locust and wild honey. Now that's rough too. You know, I, you know, one day, you know, we, uh, here when we were at the church, we had some grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are very similar to, to locusts. What, the kids, which one of you kids ate some of the, the grasshoppers that we had? A bunch of the kids, you know, I think it was Ryan, ate just like a ton of them. James, he ate some too? Yeah, my wife said you ate some. You're saying no, but my wife said you did. Elliot did. So we had these grasshoppers. They were disgusting. And they were like coated in like cheese and they had all these things that they had put on top of them. Obviously they were disgustingly horrible. But this guy is just like living out in the wilderness and his food is he's just going around and he's catching locusts and then he's eating wild honey. So he's eating locusts and wild honey. I mean this guy is an extremely tough, rough style guy. And you know what he is? I, I emphasize that to say this. This is how all the prophets were. This is how Jesus was. When you look at the prophets of the Old Testament, they're rough guys. They're rough around the edges. Their speech is crude. They're not at all like these preachers that we see today, especially the ones on the, the, you know, the TV, the televangelists, you know, these Kenneth Copeland, you know, uh, uh, name it and claim it type preachers that are just dressed in, you know, the, the, the finest Louis Vuitton outfit that is out there, that is offered. That is not at all how the, how the pastors or the preachers or the prophets the apostles, none of them were like that. You know, Peter said to the man at uh, the gate, which is called Beautiful, you know, he asked him for alms and he says, gold and silver have I none. You know, see, he didn't have a bunch of money, right? This is how the prophets were. You know, the Bible tells you that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elias. That's Elijah. Elijah was a hairy man, the Bible says. And he's described as being, being a very rough guy. You know, he's mocking the prophets. You know, he ends up slaying 450 of the prophets of Baal. This is how all the prophets were. And let me say this. This is the forerunner to Jesus. So do you think John the Baptist is going to be totally different than Jesus? You know, like John the Baptist comes and he's just like this rough guy. He's hairy, spitting. He's, he's like chomping on like locusts and eating wild honey in the middle of his preaching. And then and Jesus comes up and Jesus is like, you know, these pictures. Of course not. Jesus, they thought Jesus was John the Baptist. They said, like, who do people think you are? They're like, some say John the Baptist, some say Elias, you know, others, Jeremiah, and some of the prophets. Elias was a rough guy. Jeremiah was a rough guy. John the Baptist was a rough guy. What do you think Jesus was? He was a rougher character. He wasn't effeminate. He wasn't a sissy. He wasn't, he didn't look like Joel Osteen, like he's on a, a, a dental ad, you know, with these perfectly pristine teeth, you know. This, this is not this picture of the prophets and things that we see today. It's not compatible with the Bible. So it's important to understand, you know, what type of character they were, what type of person they were. So this is who John the Baptist was. And we're going to see the same thing with his preaching here in just a minute. So uh, back up again. We'll read verse 1 and 2 one more time. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does he start preaching immediately? He says, repent ye for what? The kingdom of heaven 
is at hand. What is the theme of the book of Matthew? We've seen it very strongly. The king of the Jews. What is he saying? The king is coming. He's saying, the king of the Jews is coming. So this, this th uh, uh, theme is not just kind of found in a couple of places. We see the royal line in Matthew 1. We see the wise men coming. Only uh, a gospel that you find that story in. And they say, hey, we're coming to see the king of the Jews. Chapter number 3, immediately when the forerunner comes to preach, the man, the messenger that goes before Jesus' face, he says, hey, the king is coming. Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what does the word repent mean? There's a lot of you know, disagreement about this. There's a lot of you know, uh, contention about this. And there's a lot of people that are very confused and that teach uh, you know, uh, even, even a false gospel when it comes to repent and repentance. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter number 21, verse number 32. So right now, technically, the question we're asking is what does John the Baptist mean when he says repent, right? He says, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, we're told exactly what he meant and what it meant for people to repent, uh, those that were listening to John the Baptist's message. I want you to look with me at verse number 32. It says this, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness. Now watch this. And ye believed him not. So it says you didn't believe him. He preached to you. And what did he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what did they do? They didn't believe. It says, And ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. So they did believe. Then it says this. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So I want you to notice that it says that when, when John the Baptist pre preached his message, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It says that they didn't believe. This is speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, the Jews as a whole, they did not believe. But it says the publicans and the harlots believed him. And it says, and when, when uh, uh, you seen it, when you saw that they had believed, ye repented not afterward. Now notice this, that ye might believe him. The word repent, the definition of the word repent means to turn. God repents more than anyone else in the Bible. God repents more than anyone else in the Bible. So if you try to tell me that the word repent means to repent of your sin, then you're telling me that God has sin. Now does God have sin? No. So that means that, of course, the Lord, when he's repenting, he's not turning from sin. What is he doing? Look it up. Every time he repents, he's changing his mind. He's changing his mind. What is the change of mind that's taking place here? It's a change of mind as far as be not believing. And he's saying, and you, when you had seen it, repented not afterward, change of mind, that you might believe him. So notice what it means here when it says repent is that it's a change of mind from from unbelief to belief. The doctrine that teaches that you need to repent of your sins <clears throat> is in fact a false gospel. Now some people, they may be confused when they say it. They may mean like admit you're a sinner. They may have some other definition of it, but the definition, what you are actually saying, words have meaning. That's why you need to be very careful with the words that we choose and the words that we use. What it actually means when you say repent of your sins is to turn from your sins. That's work salvation. That's not how we're saved. That's not how anyone is ever saved because no one, no one can turn from their sin. No one can turn from their sin. We're all sinners and the way that we get saved is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way that we get saved is by believing. Believing the gospel. That's why Jesus, when he comes on the scene and he starts preaching, he says repent and believe the gospel. He's talking to people that don't believe. And he's saying, repent and believe the gospel. He's saying, change your mind. Stop rejecting the gospel and believe the gospel. Change as far as rejecting the message and the preaching and believe the gospel. So what does it mean when John preaches repentance and to repent? It means to, he wants them to believe the message that, he's, that he's, uh, he is preaching to them. He wants them to receive it and stop rejecting it. He's, he is meant to come and to change and to turn the hearts of uh, the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers is also a part of his, uh, his purpose of when John the Baptist comes. I want you to look with me at verse number 3. It says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So for educational purposes, obviously we want to get to know our Bibles better and grow in knowledge of the Bible. Let's flip to these verses when they're mentioned. It's actually citing Isaiah chapter number 40. So turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter number 40. We're going to look at verse number 3 together. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 3. 
You have to think, hey, everybody here has heard of John the Baptist. We've heard preaching about John the Baptist. We've read about John the Baptist in various places in the Bible. But this is the, the introduction of John the Baptist. So you just, this guy just comes on the scene. You're reading your, your Bible in, in the Gospel of Matthew, and you're like, who is this guy? In those days came John the Baptist preaching and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you're like, who is this guy, right? You're reading in your Bible. Maybe you're, you know, you're a Jew and you know, early, right, maybe right after Christ, uh, you just you know, had believed the gospel. Maybe you didn't know all the details of John the Baptist. You get a, uh, you know, a gospel of Matthew. You sit down and you start reading and you're like, read verses 1 and 2. And you're like, who is this guy that I'm reading about? Well, it was actually prophesied in the Old Testament that would be a man that would come before Jesus. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now watch this. Make straight, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So one thing we can learn here is what? That a wilderness is a what? It's a desert. When you look up the animals that are mentioned being in a wilderness, <clears throat> if you just look up the word wilderness, there's a few times where animals are mentioned. It's always animals that would be you know, more so acclimated to a desert-like climate. So if you look up the animals, you can tell that. But then right here we can see the two are being used interchangeably. And it says that there's going to be a man that comes and cries in the wilderness, that prepares the way of the Lord. So what John the Baptist's job is, is you know, this is a serious event. This is where the Messiah is coming. God himself, the Lord himself, and turn to Malachi 4 if you will. God himself, the Lord himself is coming to the earth. He's coming to the earth. He's coming to his people. He's obviously come to save his people. But he's obviously coming also to preach messages. He's coming to teach them and to be an example and an example to them. So before Jesus comes, God wanted to send just prior before that John the Baptist. John the Baptist goes to prepare their hearts, to get people saved, and also to get people to get their heart right, so that when Jesus comes, that they'll receive his preaching, so that when Jesus comes, maybe John the Baptist sowed some seed, and then it's been watered, and then Jesus can come afterwards, and Jesus can come, and that harvest can be reaped. He can give the increase, right? And he can get more people saved. He can teach them once they already are saved. It's to prepare their hearts. So look with me at Malachi chapter number 4. This is uh, referred to, that is, uh, John the Baptist coming again. Look at the end there, verse number 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Watch this. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I want you to notice that John the Baptist's purpose is to come and to get people's hearts right. It's to come and to get people saved, and it's, a, and it's to come and to have, you know, they're basically a highway laid out, right, for the king to come. For, that's why John the Baptist, when he comes, what is he saying? He's saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look with me at verse number 4 again in Matthew chapter number 3. Now that we see that John the Baptist is that forerunner that was prophesied to come before the Christ in the Old Testament, look again at verse number 4. We read this earlier. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and his meat, the word meat there, remember, means food, was locusts and wild honey. And watch this. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. So there's, this is a, a large you know, throng of people, a very large multitude uh, of people that came out to hear his preaching. He's starting, starting to stir things up with the power of God's word. People are hearing about it. There's a prophet. Who is this guy? And tons of people are just you know, flowing to him. It says in verse number 6, And were baptized of him in Jordan. So this is the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So there's many people that are being baptized, people that obviously have been saved. Afterwards, they are baptized and says they're confessing their sins. A lot of people, I'm sure, maybe have been saved for years. They're getting their heart right. They're being baptized. They confess their sins to God. They're getting their life right with God. Look, uh, verse number 7 now. So also, look who else came. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
So I want you to notice the reason why I emphasize John the Baptist's character is because we need to get the right idea of how he looks and things like that because that'll kind of tell us what type of person he is, right? When we see John the Baptist begin to preach, you know, obviously, you know, uh, uh, it, it matches the, the appearance when he starts to preach here. He says this, he says, Old generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So we just get the picture. So he just sees the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they are religious leaders and they're false religious leaders at that. They are not, according to Jesus, they were not worshiping and serving the God of the Bible. You know, the Old Testament, it was not Judaism. People are like, oh, we're, we you know, Jude Christian, Judeo-Christians, right? That's not who we are. We are Christians. Judaism is a false religion. It's a religion today of those that strayed away from the God of the Bible and rejected him. Jesus said to the Jews of his day, this day, he said, if ye believe Moses, ye believe me, for he wrote of me. So they did not believe in the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible came and they rejected him and crucified him. And they didn't know the voice of the stranger. That's actually, or the voice of the shepherd. They followed the voice of the stranger. They didn't go after Jesus because they weren't of his sheep. They were not saved. They were worshiping a false god. It was not the god of the Bible. So when they come to him, he sees them and they're false you know, religious leaders. And when you look at how you know, uh, those that damn the souls of others are, are uh, you know, pictured and what light they're put in in the Bible, it's a very dim light. They're spoken, go read 2 Peter chapter number 2 about false prophets. Go read the book of Jude. You know, it's just like using the word ungodly over and over, like every other verse, just speaking about these people, just ripping these people apart. John the Baptist was the exact same way. As soon as he saw these men coming, he says to them, old generation of vipers. You know what a viper is? It's a venomous snake. Do you know what he's saying? Like in our words today, like it would be like saying you snake. That's pretty bad, isn't it? He's saying old generation of snakes. He's saying old generation of vipers. He's saying they're, they're subtle. He's saying they're deceptive. They're like Satan. That's how he's like, why he's likened unto a snake. So he says, old generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. What is he, what is he projecting on them too? That they're going to receive wrath, aren't they? They're going to receive wrath. This is, you know, uh, also ties in with what we read in Malachi 4. That Elias, right? Elijah and, G and John the Baptist we know came in the spirit of Elijah. He was to come to warn them of the wrath to come. So obviously they were, you know, thinking, well, this must be Elias that's out here, right? So he's preaching against them. He's ripping them a new one. Look at verse number 8. We'll get to some doctrine here and learn some things in verse 8, 9, and 10. We'll read those together. He says to them, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Then he says this, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So notice there in verse number 10 he talks about bringing forth good fruit. He said the same thing in verse number 8. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Now why did he say that? What does it say that they came to him for? It says came to his baptism. So why do you think G uh, John the Baptist would be saying this? Saying, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance, saying things that are fit for repentance that would make me think that you repented and then I would baptize you. That's what he's saying. They're coming to his baptism and they're coming to him and saying, oh, you generation of vipers. You, you know, when you put it into this perspective, it's kind of like, whoa, man, calm down, right? It's hard preaching. We don't hear it very often today, but it's biblical preaching. It says, oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And he says, bring forth therefore fruits, Meet for repentance. And you want to be baptized of me, bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. Now there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, interpretations on what it means to bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. Bring forth fruit. I want you to look at, uh, with me at Matthew 7. This is normally the passage, obviously slide in your bulletin there, Matthew 3. But look with me at Matthew 7. This is the passage where people will turn to all the time to try to uh, interpret and to explain to you what it means to bring forth fruit. Uh, it's one of the most famous passages. When the Pharisees and Sadducees are coming to him, he's speaking to them as false prophets. You know, they are false religious leaders. They're false prophets. Look with me at verse number 15. This is very, you'll notice the context is the same. It's like a parallel passage. 
It says in verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Now pay attention to this. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree, watch this, bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Watch this. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Do you notice that parallel there with what we read in Matthew chapter number 3? Talks about cutting the tree down if it doesn't bring forth good fruit and casting it in the fire. Talks about the importance of bringing forth good fruit. And notice what, this is Jesus speaking, what Jesus explains. He says, you know, if you, if you bring forth good fruit, that means that the tree's good, right? If you bring forth bad fruit, that means that what? The tree's bad. So see how it ties in with cutting the tree down at the roots. We would get rid of the tree just completely because why? Because what are you doing when you cut a tree at the roots? You're getting rid of the whole tree. So the way to see whether the roots are bad, you don't need to dig up and look at the roots. You would just look at the fruit. And you'd say, well, if it's bearing bad fruit, the whole tree is bad, right? The whole entire tree is bad. So let's just cut the whole tree down. That's what he's teaching. If it's bearing good fruit, you know that the tree's good. It's a good, it's a good tree. Now, what most people teach, uh, there's, two, there's actually two interpretations. What most people teach is that the bringing forth fruit is good works. And they'll say, see what John the Baptist is saying is, and this is, this is a false gospel, this is very bad. You've got to you know, good, do good things you know, to prove that you're saved. You know, be good and then I'll know that you're saved. I'll know that you're, you're sincere and you've really you know, repented. Now, is that a, a, a true gospel? No, the Bible teaches that it's just by faith alone. The Bible has scores and scores of examples. It's written about, you know, sinners is what it's written about. It's about Christian men that are sinners. And they, some of them commit adultery, murder, you know, theft, a lot of bad things. So that doesn't prove by based upon your works whether or not you're saved. So that just in itself, if we try to like get that to fit, that interpretation, it's like, man, that doesn't sound right, does it? That should be like a false alarm to you, a red flag to you immediately. An alarm should go off. Like something's not right here. That that's works. The other interpretation that I've heard of this is the way that you can peg like a false prophet or a false teacher is based on their fruit as in their protégés, the people that they train. The people like, like look at their fruit as in like look at the people in their you know, pews or look at the people in their church or look at maybe the people that they've sent out, right? And go and talk to those pastors and see... Uh, you know, the people that they've sent out and see what, you know, uh, uh, those people say. That's their fruit. And that's how you'll see whether they're, you know, a good tree if you go and you look at their fruit. Now, I'm going to show you that neither one of these interpretations are correct. And it's not just my private interpretation. That's what I believe both of those to be. I'm going to show you what the, the Bible actually tells you what it's speaking of when it says bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. I want you to look with me. Let's go over in the book of Matthew just a couple of chapters. We're going to go to Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12. So we're looking at a lot more passages than we usually do. We normally stay in Matthew 3 that much. But it's good to see a lot of Bible and compare a lot of Bible. Compare Scripture to Scripture. Look with me at Matthew 12, verse number 33. We get our answer for what is being discussed here. It says this in Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good... Or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Now watch this, verse 34. O generation of vipers. Now does all this sound familiar? It's almost exactly what he said to John the Baptist, right? Look at what it says next. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, that's like the tree, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things, that's your fruit. And an evil man, that's an evil tree or a bad tree, out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So notice what's the fruit there. 
It's the words that they speak, isn't it? I want you to flip over and go to the book of Luke real quick. Luke chapter number 6. We'll see this again even in greater detail. Luke chapter number 6. Look at verse number 43. So what was the fruit there? And what was the tree? Notice the person was the tree. And if we were to be more specific, their heart was the tree. And what was the fruit? It was the things that they speak. Now let me ask you this. When we want to find out whether or not a person's saved, totally unrelated just for a moment, what do we do? We knock on their door, and Brother Rick, what do you say to them? Right, that's right. I put him on the spot. He's like, what do I say, right? Yeah. You've been soul winning in a while? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. You ask him, you knock him on the door, and you say, hey, you know, if you die today, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? And you know what I'm going to find out? They're going to bring forth fruit. It's going to be the fruit of their lips. And I'm going to see what type of tree is inside of there. You know what it's going to tell me if they bring forth corrupt fruit? Do you know what it's going to tell me about their heart? Their heart's corrupt. If they bring forth good fruit, do you know what it's going to tell me about their heart? That's a good heart. That's going to tell me that person's saved. That's going to tell me that person, they're bringing forth fruit that's meat or fit for repentance. Showing me that that person has repented. Now, what does it mean to repent? To change your mind, to stop you know, trusting in yourself, stop not believing the gospel, and believe the gospel. So when they bring forth that fruit that says, hey, I'm going to heaven because I've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's fruit meat for repentance. Amen. That shows, hey, you got a good heart. There's a, you know, a good tree in there. Look at Luke chapter number 6, and it is verse number 43. Luke chapter number 6, verse 43. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, or of his heart, I'm sorry, for the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So notice that the words are the fruits of the lips. That is the fruit, and the way that you get to the heart, and to see whether the heart is good, you just go and look at the... The, uh, the fruit. Now I want you to go back with me to Matthew 7. And I'm going to even demonstrate this to you from Matthew 7. Uh, you can see this very clearly in Matthew 7. Look with me at verse 19. That's where we left off. It says, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's why he says this in verse 20. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on to explain to you that, you know, not everybody that just says Lord. So what's he tying it to? Words. He's going on to explain that some people will say, Lord, Lord. And furthermore, these specific people that say, Lord, Lord, that call him Lord, what is the, the, the fruit of their lips when you get dig down into it? What do they say to him? They say, exactly. They say, haven't we done? Don't look at all of our wonderful works. So you know what you see there? That's the fruit of their lips. And you know what it tells you? There's a bad tree there. So you knock on somebody's door and they're like, you know, and, and you really want to, obviously we go out and we want people to be saved. We go door to door so we can find out you know, whether or not people are, are saved and unsaved and then present them to the gospel. So we ask them right off the bat, if you died today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? Some people say, yes, I'm positive and they're confident. You're like, okay, well, you know, that's great news. But let me ask you this, if you don't mind, you know, what do you believe a person has to do to get to heaven? And oftentimes people will say, well, I know that I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person, because I go to church, I read my Bible, I keep my commandments. You know what that tells me? Those are, those are not, that is not fruit that's meat for repentance. That's not a good heart. You know, that's a, that's a, a corrupt heart. So what we want to do is we, wanna, we want to preach to them the gospel, and then they can have Christ's righteousness, and they can have that good heart in there, and then they'll speak to you good fruit from that good tree. So you need to get to the root of the matter is what you need to do. Go back with me to Matthew chapter number 3. I'm going to show you this from Matthew chapter number 3. So we're learning a lot of doctrine tonight, a lot of good stuff here. So he says, in verse number 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So these are false teachers. He doesn't believe that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or believe in the God of the Bible. So he says, Bring forth their fruit, therefore fruits meet for repentance. Saying like, Prove to me that you've repented and you actually believe and then I'll baptize you. Now watch what he says next in verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves. Notice what he tied it in with. What did he say? Think not to say within yourself. He said, hey, bring forth fruit. And then he says, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. He's saying that's a bad tree. Notice how he ties it in with the words that they speak when he tells them to bring forth fruit. He's telling them not to bring forth bad fruit. 
So he says, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. <clears throat> Excuse me. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And that's how the Jews, of course, were. They trusted in their own flesh. They thought that their own you know, uh, uh, flesh, their own race, their own nation was just superior to all other nations. They thought they were going to heaven just because they were an Israelite or just because they were a Jew. They thought that they were going you know, to go to heaven. And they say, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. And then he, because they think that's such a big deal, that that's good enough to get them to heaven, just by itself, he says, For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children in Abraham. What is he saying? He's saying it's not that big of a deal because you're Abraham's son. You know, that's not that, that significant because God of these stones could raise up children unto Abraham. He's also, you know, teaching them when he makes that statement that there are going to be other people that are not, think about that, that are not, you know, the children of Abraham fleshly, physically. And then they put their faith in Christ, and then what happens? God raises up them as being what? A child of Abraham. So you can see that here. Like, hey, it's not that big of a deal. God could just take that, and he could just give, you know, uh, supposedly, you know, you being an Israelite, he could just award somebody else with that. He could just say, hey, they're an Israelite now. Look at verse 10. He says, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So we saw that, you know, he's talking about the tree when it brings forth fruit. But notice how he says the root of the tree. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter number 8. We'll kind of see what he's getting at here. So notice, just prior to that, he made a statement about Abraham. And them thinking, oh, you know, because I'm of Abraham, you know, I'm good. I don't have anything to worry about, right? Abraham's my father, right? And we see the Jews even doing this. You know, they even tell Jesus one time, you know, you know Jesus says to them, you know, you shall know the, the truth and the truth shall, shall uh, set you free. And they're like, hey, we've never been in bondage to any man. You know, we're, we're the children of Abraham. What are they saying? They're trusting in their flesh, aren't they? They're trusting in being Abraham's child is what they're doing. And they think that that's enough and that that is good enough for them. So notice that he says, hey, you know, that's not significant. That's not enough for you. And he says, and, and you know what? It's time now where there's, gonna be a, there's going to be a fork in the road. That's what he's saying. The time has come where the ax is going to be laid under the root of the tree. What is he implying? Like people are going to kind of be like, you know, maybe pulled out of the family tree. Doesn't it kind of link to your minds like a family tree almost? You're thinking of Abraham. That's not good enough. He can put people in that family tree and remove people out of that family tree. Doesn't that kind of sound like what he's saying? Look at Matthew chapter number 8. Look at verse number 10. Speaking about a Gentile, someone that is not born of Abraham, he says, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, talking about from many nations, many Gentiles, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But watch this. But the children of the kingdom, that's like the Pharisees, that's like the Sadducees, shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what you see here in Matthew chapter number 3 is really... The first time in the New Testament where it's clearly preached that many of Jerusalem, many of the Jews are going to be rejected. And there's going to be a transition that takes place where God is going to take the kingdom from the Israelites and he's going to give it to a kingdom bringing forth what? The fruits thereof. Notice how it all ties together. Bring, bring forth the fruits thereof. When we look here in Matthew chapter number 3 and he's speaking to the Jews, this is their warning. There is a fork in the road right now because why? The king of the Jews is coming and they have to make a decision. They have, to, they have to repent and they have to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in the God of the Bible. And if they don't, they're going to be cut out. And this is their warning. John the Baptist is coming and warning them that this is your last opportunity. That is the message that's being preached. He pre he's preaching the gospel, but he's also warning many of them that have strayed away into false doctrine of false religion, this is your last chance. He's saying the time has come where now we're laying the axe, what does it mean? To the root of the tree. He's saying we're getting rid of you. We're getting rid of you entirely. If you don't you know, have your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we're going to be taking you out of the family tree. And you know what we're going to do? There's going to be many from the east and the west. Like it talks about in Romans 11 in the olive tree, they're going to be grafted in. 
Others are going to become, you know, come and they're going to be grafted in. That's why he says that he can raise from stones children of Abraham. That's what's being taught here. Look with me at verse number 11 now. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Of course, John the Baptist is speaking of Jesus. And he's saying, you know, I'm coming and I'm baptizing you with water. You know, and, and, and you know, obviously people are thinking G G uh, John the Baptist is a big deal. And, uh, you know, he, he procured a lot of followers, a lot of disciples because he was a great man of God. And he's preaching. But while he's preaching, he says, hey, I indeed baptize you with water. People are coming out here and it's important. They're getting baptized with water. But then he says, but he that cometh after me, this is him warning, hey, there's somebody else that's coming. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. You see the humility of John the Baptist there. And he says, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. You know, in another, you look at this and in one of the other Gospels, it gives you some more information. It says that he's not, even, he's not even worthy to bend down, to stoop down, and to unloose or loosen the straps of his shoes, basically. He's, not even, he's saying that I'm not even worthy to, you know, to get on my hands and knees and just to take his shoes off, basically. You see the great humility that John the Baptist has here. So he's saying, and because you know, he's greater than me, you know, he's going to baptize you, it says, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. While John the Baptist is just doing a water baptism, right? Look at verse 12. It says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, what, what he's discussing here is, this is also another analogy. This is him speaking about a threshing floor. Like when you go out and you, and you gather wheat, right? You gather all the sheaves, right? You have this big, you know, this big bundle of sheaves with, you know, all of the crops. And on the end is what you have, what is the wheat. But are you going to keep the whole stalk and make bread out of the stalk? Of course not. That's what's called chaff, right? And there's other parts of it that's referred to as chaff as well. There's other parts of the husk and things like that. But, you know, uh, that's what he's discussing here. He's saying he will throughly, so the fan is in his hand. He said he will throughly purge his floor. Purge means to clean. He's talking about the floor of the, of the uh, threshing floor. It's a room like a, like a uh, uh, somewhat like, uh, you know, a small storage barn area where you would go in and you would, uh, you, that's where you would thresh the wheat. You would bang the wheat out. And you would separate the chaff from the wheat. You want to keep the good stuff that you make the bread with, right? And then you go and you clean it up. And one of the ways that they do it is they'll have a fan and it will get rid of the things that don't have weight like the chaff. It'll blow that away. And then you'll go pick up all the chaff and stuff and throw it in the garbage. So now he's likening, you know, the, the wheat unto those that get saved. And those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he's likening the chaff unto those that reject. So this is the same thing that John the Baptist was saying about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And actually, what he means at the end of verse number 11, and I know that some of this is a little heavy. You know, there's a lot of on top of one verse on top of the next, and it's really deep. But we're going verse by verse, and that's a, one of the purposes of, of uh, you know, going verse by verse in Bible studies. Look at the end of verse 11. It says, He shall baptize you. Talking about Jesus, it says this, With the Holy Ghost, and then it says, And with fire. Now that's not talking about one person being baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's talking about different people that he's preaching to. He's got people that are receiving the gospel and people that are not receiving the gospel. And he's saying when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and then there's others that will be baptized with fire. Now what does baptism mean? What does the word baptize mean? What, is the, what does it mean? It means immersion. That's the definition of the word. It means to be immersed. That's why when you're water baptized, what happens? You're put under the water, right? You're totally put under the water. Now, there's what's discussed later in the New Testament, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's when people will speak with other tongues. They'll do miracles because they're just immersed or full, right, with the Holy Spirit. But then he talks about other people that are going to be baptized or immersed with what? With fire. Then, now this should make sense to you, the analogy. In verse number 12, he says, hey, there's the wheat. That's those that are saved. That's those that receive the Holy Ghost. 
right? They're going to be taken and they're put into the storage, right? He's going to gather the wheat into his garner. That's a storage area. And then he says, and then the chaff, he's going to burn with unquenchable what? Fire. So notice, he's separating again. Holy Ghost, fire. The good, the bad, right? And there's parables that are told about this too, and we'll compare those you know, later when we get to that. Uh, it's actually in the book of Matthew when we get to that chapter. So that's what that means. I've heard you know, weird interpretations of that too, but you know, Holy Ghost and fire, is not, it's not the day of Pentecost. That's not what it's talking about at all. Look at verse number 13. It says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. I want you to turn with me. Let's look over at Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew chapter number 11. I want you to look at something that it tells us about John the Baptist. Jesus tells us about John the Baptist. It says in uh, uh, verse number 9, it says, But what went ye out for to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. And keep reading, verse 10. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John the Baptist was not just a normal man. John the Baptist, according to Jesus, according to God, was the greatest man that had ever lived. The greatest, he said there's never risen a greater than he. Obviously, Jesus is in a whole other category. He's God manifest in the flesh. But he says, of just normal men, he's not just a prophet. He's the greatest man that ever lived. And when you look at John the Baptist's life, do you know the reason why he was such a great man? All the things that keep standing out to, to you about him? His great humility. He has just this enormous amount of true, sincere humility. He says, hey, you know, the guy that's coming after me, he's so much greater than me, I'm not even, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and loose, loosen his sandals. You know, there's another time where his disciples come to him, John the Baptist's disciples come to him and they're like, don't you know that there's many people following John the Baptist, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus and leaving you? So his disciples come to John the Baptist and are like, can't you see that everybody's leaving you and now they're going and following Jesus? You know what John the Baptist says? He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. He's happy about that and he says that, hey, what we should be doing is increasing him and exalting him and in order to increase him, I have to decrease myself. And that's true in our everyday lives when we worship God as well. When you get down on your hands and knees you know, to praise God, you're exalting Him, but you know what you're doing to yourself at the same time? You're humbling yourself. You know what you're doing when you set maybe your time aside of things that you're interested in and things that you would like to do in your life and you read your Bible? Maybe you pray. Maybe you go soul winning. You're saying, hey, He's more important than me. The things of God are more important than myself. You're increasing Him while decreasing yourself. And when Jesus came to John the Baptist and said, you know, I want to be baptized, John. He knows him. It's his cousin. He says, I want to be baptized, John. And he comes to him and John says, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? I mean, this is just a sincere humility. Why was John the Baptist such a great man? The greatest man that had ever lived because of his great humility. You look at every great man of God in the Bible. It doesn't matter who it is. King Saul, when he was chosen, he hid himself among the stuff when they tried to come to anoint him to be the first king of Israel. Why? Because he was humble. And Samuel later says to him when he becomes built up with pride, he says, when thou wast little in thine sight, thine own sight, God chose you. But God's not interested in you anymore. You know, you have David. He was a man after God's own heart. And you see David when, when uh, uh, Saul is trying to, of course, you know, uh, uh, conspire against him. David sets up, of, uh, uh, Saul sets up David to marry his daughter. And he's like, you think it's a little thing to marry, you know, the king's daughter? And he's like, I'm of the least of the tribes of Judah. He's like, look at me. Who am I? I'm not worthy to do that. Why was David such a great man of God? Because of his humility. Why was John the Baptist the greatest man? Because of his great humility. That's what most of the chapter is about, about John the Baptist, how we can learn from him. And, you know, 
what type of man he was, the type of preaching. But most of all, what is most known about him and the greatest thing about him is his great humility. That's what stands out the most. And you see it in the statement when he says, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? He's saying, I should be being baptized of you because you're so great. He's saying, you're coming to me. What an honor. Can you imagine being able to do that? I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? To be able to baptize Jesus? It, you know, that's something that will go down in the history books for sure. You know, I don't care what you get to brag about of what you've done in your life. John the Baptist can always say, hey, you know what I did? He's like, I baptized Jesus, dude. That's not cool at all. He's like, Jesus came. God came to the earth. And he's like, John, I want you to baptize me. But guess what? John would never say that because he's humble, right? It's because he has the right heart. That's why he went to him. Because of his humility, his great humility. I mean, there's really no greater honor than to be the one that's like the forerunner to Christ. The one that baptizes Christ and pushes him out and initiates. This is what initiates Jesus' ministry. But there's a, one more thing that I want to point out in this chapter. <clears throat> Very important. Verse number 15, he says, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so. Suffer means to allow. Right? Like to allow it, even though you don't want to. Right? When you're going through suffering, think of it that way. Suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us, saying we must do this. To fulfill all righteousness. And it says, then he suffered him. Then he allowed him. You know what he did? He baptized him. Right? There are many people that would say that baptism is what saves you. Well, number one, the Bible says that we're not saved by works. And baptism is something that you do. We're not saved by, by works. We're saved by faith alone. Right? The grace of God and then our faith is what saves us. And uh, Church of Christ members, if you bump into them, they'll be like, well, <clears throat> the Bible says we're not saved by works of the law. This is something very often that they, they've said, and I've talked to them about this, and they've said this to me. They'll say, we're not saved by works of the law, but we're saved by the works of righteousness in the New Testament. Right? We're saved by, by our own righteousness in the New Testament and the commandments that are given in the New Testament. Well, the Bible actually says, number one, there's a verse that like, just debunks what they're saying. You know, and that's Titus 3.5. It says, not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. So I want you to notice that verse says, we're not saved by works of righteousness. What does Jesus say that he is doing? He says, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And what is he doing? He's being baptized. So the, the work of baptism is a work of what? To fulfill what? All righteousness. Do you know what that tells you when it says not by works of righteousness? It's saying not by baptism. You know, Jesus came to fulfill the law, didn't he? He said he's going to come, come to fulfill the law. Why did he come to fulfill the law? Because you cannot. That's why. And at the moment that you put your faith in Christ, yes, he takes away all your sins, and, and it's all on him, but do you know what he gives you? His righteousness. Amen. He gives you his righteousness. So you say, what about people that believe on Christ that never get baptized? Well, Christ was baptized for them because he kept the law perfectly. You say, what about people that believe on Christ, you know, and that have committed adultery? Well, guess what? They have Christ's righteousness now. And Christ never committed adultery. Yeah. It's the same concept. What about if I, you know, I, I, you know, committed fornication or something horrible after I was saved? Well, did Christ commit fornication? Did you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, now you have the Christ, you know, Jesus' righteousness. The Messiah's righteousness. He got baptized for you, just in case you didn't. He fulfilled all the law and he had to keep all of the commandments just in case, you know, you weren't able to do something, right? Because Do we keep all the commandments? Of course not. He kept all the commandments for us so that he could give us that righteousness. Shows you how great of a God he is. He loves us so much. He's like, hey, I'm going to come down and pay for all your sins. But not only that, I'll just go ahead and keep all the commandments and then I'll just say you did it, right? And then he gives, you, gives us his righteousness. Look at verse number 16. It says, And Jesus, when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So it says when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water. So if he's coming up out of the water, where was he? He was in the water, right? It says he went up straightway out of the water. There's a debate, you know, how are we supposed to baptize? You know? Should we, there's different forms. Should we sprinkle? Should we, you know, it's called a fusion. Should we just pour it on like the baby's head? 
Or should we immerse, which is actually what the word baptized means in the first place. That's a hint. You know, but we see Jesus. How was Jesus baptized? He was baptized by immersion because what? He came straightway up out of the water. So that's how we know that he was John the Baptist. Because how do Baptists baptize? They immerse. No, I'm just kidding, right? Yeah. He's, it's not, have you ever heard, it's not John the Methodist. It's John the Baptist, right? And how do we know that? It's because, you know, it was immersion, right? It's not, and I've heard this before, this is funny. It's not non-denom John, right? It's, it's John the Baptist, okay? So that's funny, yeah. It says, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Now, furthermore, too, I'll give you two other points on that. This is important. We're going to close right now. John the Baptist in John chapter number 3, it says that he was baptizing uh, uh, in Anon near to Salem. Right? Why? Because there was much water there. Why did he need much water? Because he needed to have enough water to put somebody under. If you were just sprinkling, you would just need a cup of water. Literally. Or even pouring water. You wouldn't need very much. You wouldn't need much water. He's picking out these areas where it's the depth you know, is sufficient to be able to immerse someone underneath the water. In Acts chapter number 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is baptized and he says, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And it says and they, that both of them got out of the chariot and went down into the water. Why do they need to get down into the water in order for this to take place? Could have just walked up to the shore of water and got some water and sprinkled it in his face if that's all you had to do. No, they had to go into the water because they need, he needed to be dunked under the water. What does it mean to be baptized? Well, for us, it represents the death burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. The death while we're up and like he is on the cross. The burial going underneath being immersed like he was in the tomb and then the resurrection of Christ. So that is what baptism represents. Amen. Verse number uh, 17 the Bible will end here. It says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So this is the beginning of Christ's ministry. This is big. The majority of the chapter was about John the Baptist. We learn a lot about him and uh, what type of person he is, what he looked like. And there's quite a few doctrines that are taught in Matthew 3. It, got, it started getting a lot heavier and very meaty. And I don't want to, you know, I, I want to try to, you know, leave no stones unturned when we go through verse by verse. That's the purpose of this. So it can be a little bit meaty, but we learned a lot of doctrines. It ends here with the baptism of Jesus Christ. That's pretty important. The baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what begins his ministry. And this is what should begin, you know, your Christianity. This is, you know, when you look in the Bible, when people get baptized, it's usually right after they get saved. The same hour when people get saved, they're taken and they're baptized. Very often, the very same hour. So, you know, if you have been saved and you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. You know, whether it's a kid, an adult, whatever it may be. When people get saved, you need to try to push them. Hey, come and get baptized. It's very, very important. Furthermore, why is it important? Because what did Jesus say when... Je what did uh, the Lord say from heaven? What did the Father say about His Son when He was baptized? He said, This is my beloved Son in whom what? I am well pleased. Now, I'm sure He was pleased with every area of His life, right? And that's one of the reasons why He says that. Because He's the Lord from heaven, right? He's God in the flesh. But why does he say it at this moment? Because it fulfilled him. It's a part of our righteousness. It's a part of good things that we do. Now, of course, our righteousness is not what gets us into heaven. But God still wants us to live a good life, right? You know, God still wants us while we're on this earth to keep his commandments. And it's pleasing in God's sight for you to be baptized. So if you haven't been baptized, make sure that you get baptized, right? In a Baptist church by, you know, uh, the lineage of John the Baptist. No, I'm just kidding. Let's bow our head and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear God, for all the great things. Even so much doctrine that we can even just learn in Matthew chapter number 3 on so many levels. Dear Lord, re uh, replacement theology, just so many, so many things. We love you so much and please be with us. Bless all the families that are here tonight. Dear God, we thank you. Uh, for uh, a great and beautiful day. We thank you for life, dear Lord. We thank you for uh, uh, the fellowship between the brethren. We ask you that you would uh, bless the rest of the night and keep us all safe, dear Lord, and continue to bless our church here. And we love you so much. And be with us on our drive home. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.